Okay, uh, let's get started with the discussion on Markov decision problem. So, let's go back to the previous uh, few lectures. So, we have studied maximum principle, we have studied dynamic programming for deterministic systems. And then we studied stochastic programming, particularly two-stage stochastic program, uh, especially news vendors problem. Uh, so, so in two-stage stochastic program, you have some uncertainty that get real, gets realized in the second stage, so you have to take an action at stage one, uh, keeping in mind that something will happen in stage two that you don't know about, uh, but you somehow take the expectation of what you're going to see in the future and then optimize the overall cost, right? And we studied stage two program, stage one program in the previous class. Now, there are situations where the decision horizon is very, very long, okay? So what are the cases where decision horizon is not one stage, not two stage, uh, but multiple stages? So let me start with a, a famous example of chess. Right, so you're, when you're playing chess, you don't quite know when the game is going to end. And I don't know how many of you have played chess, but sometimes the game can go on and on for several hours, okay? Um, so, really bad. sorry? Especially if I'm playing because I'm really bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so in some cases, so, so in that case, the decision horizon, so the number of time steps, capital T, is uncertain. Right? So you don't know when the game is going to end, but it's also extremely large. Sometimes T could be of the order of uh, 500 or 1,000. Right? Uh, the second uh, problem could be uh, in civil engineering. So you have reservoirs, like there is a Hoover Dam in the north of Columbus. I don't know how many of you have been there. Right? So there is a big reservoir, there is a dam, and what you need to do is make sure that you have enough water in the reservoir for agriculture or whatever other purposes that reservoir might be used for. Uh, but the water level has to be within certain limits, right? You don't want the water level to be too high, otherwise the dam might get damaged or the water might seep into houses nearby and all that. So, so that's really a very long horizon problem. So every day you have to monitor the water level and you have to open or close the dam depending upon what the current water level is, what the current rainfall is. And in this situation, rainfall is a completely random variable. And more importantly, when it rains, some amount of water goes into the ground table and other water runs off and gets into the reservoir system, right? So there is a lot of randomness involved in it, uh, in this particular reservoir problem. And the goal is to make sure that the water level is at certain level and it's not too high and it's not too low, okay? Uh, the other... Uh, so this is, a, this is a problem which has long horizon and which has a lot of uncertainty, which gets realized over a period of time. Um, then another application is robot motion planning. So you are, let's say, an autonomous car, and you're going on the road, uh, and you have people all over the place, other cars are all around you, and they are taking some actions which are completely random. Of course, it's random from your perspective. I mean, they certainly have some algorithm in mind that they are using to navigate in that environment. So Again, from your perspective, from your autonomous car's perspective, what's happening around you is random, and you want to take an action that is the safest driving decisions at that particular moment, depending upon the configuration of other uh, people around you, right? And people more generally means, I mean, people, what, when I say people, I really mean that there are pedestrians, there could be animal, or there could also be, I mean, and there are other cars around you on the road, right? So, um, so again, the decision horizon is pretty long. So let's say you're driving for two hours, so you have to make a decision every second. So that's 7,200 time steps uh, when you need to make a decision. And uh, there is uncertainty all around you, okay? So that's, again, a problem where there is uncertainty which, reali which gets realized over a period of time, and your decision horizon is pretty long. Okay, you had a question. Yeah, so when we're talking about like the autonomous car example, right? Uh, uh, does the modeling get any easier if if we're surrounded by other autonomous cars? Or is it no, it's not. Okay. Uh, partially because uh, I mean certainly, uh, so there is a technology called V to V communication which allows one autonomous car to talk to another autonomous car. So in that case, a lot of uncertainty 
is not there, which is there in the real driving scenario that we see today. But uh, even if, if like they're identical cars with identical all algorithms and they're just in different positions and you're sitting in one of them, having it be an identical car in a different location doesn't uh, reduce some of the uncertainty at all? It certainly reduces the uncertainty. It reduces uncertainty by a huge amount, but it's still not completely deterministic because there could be pedestrian, there could be animals, deers, and whatnot. Uh, Okay, there's another question in agriculture that people worry about, which is how much, how many seeds of what variety to plant on a field depending upon the weather conditions that will be realized in the future and, uh, and what the condition of the soil um, at that particular moment. So I'm, I don't know much about these class of problems, but I read it online that many people have studied this problem from an MDP perspective. Uh, then, uh, question, then there are, of course, a large uh, amount of literature in uh, queuing theory where the, uh, where the problem is how many, how to, let's say you are in a, in a call center, right? You are in charge of designing an algorithm in a call center where people call, you know, my credit card is something, something is happening to my credit card, I want to talk to a representative and all that, right? So you get all these calls, you need to route these calls to an appropriate representative um, in order to make sure that the entire customer can be served in as small time, as little time as possible, okay? So even in that case, the calls are coming in a very random fashion um, and the representatives are also random, so some of them may be out, some of them may be in. Um, and then the question is, how do you design an algorithm so that you can serve all the customers in as little time as possible? Um, you could also have uh, problems in, uh, in communication networks where you want to minimize the delay of taking a data packet from source to destination through an appropriate choice of routing policy. And the issue is different links in the communication network might be congested with whatever probability and which is a completely random variable, and so you want to make sure that your routing decision minimizes the total travel time uh, for this particular packet. Okay, so a lot of problems, um, as I've mentioned, are such where there is uncertainty in the system, it's a dynamic decision problem, the number of time steps over which you have to act is pretty long, and one needs to have a conceptual framework to model and think about this big class of problems that we are seeing on a day-to-day -day setting. And one of the things that um, some mathematician uh, came up with, I think in early 1900s, was this whole idea of Markov decision problems. Okay, so this umbrella of Markov decision problem essentially attempts to model such dynamic systems um, uh, in an appropriate fashion, in a mathematically elegant fashion, so you can study a few algorithms and then you can go and apply it to all these different settings. So what is Markov decision problems? So in the deterministic system, which we have studied before, we have xt plus 1 equals ft of xt comma ut and you have j of u naught to ut minus 1 equals summation of ct xt ut t equals 0 to capital T minus 1. Let's say there is no terminal cost. So in the MDP case, we have xt plus 1 equals f of xt ut wt. So this is the noise. And then you have xt is observed at every time. Okay, so it's important that you observe the state at every point of time. And 
and you have multiple options of formulating the cost function. Okay. Yes. So is it the case here that the next state doesn't necessarily follow from the actions that we take? Uh, yes, because there is an ex external noise okay. that affects the state um, in a different way. So let me give you the example. You have certain level in the dam today. Mm -hmm. You let a lot, some amount of water pass through the dam. So of course you expect that it should be the amount of water already there in the dam minus the amount of water that you let out. But then there is some rainfall in some areas which the water runs off and gets into the reservoir. So it basically changes your water level by a small amount. Okay. Okay. So that's the uncertainty. Uh, this WT is essentially capturing how much water is entering from nearby areas. So is this related to a Markov chain problem where we're just using the control to attempt to force the direction we go? Uh, so Markov chain, in the Markov chain problem there is no UT. Okay. Because it's not a decision problem, it's just a Markov chain, it's a stochastic process. In this case, it's called Markov decision problem because you have an action to take. Okay. okay. Uh, there are, of course, connections between Markov chains and MDPs, uh, but we'll get, we, we, of course, we won't cover it in this class. So is there, there like a way we can update, what is it, the uh, bellman kolmogorov equation? And, uh, and no, I don't think we'll get into all that right now. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, okay. So w what are the things that we notice is different from the deterministic case? Of course, there is a noise variable that wasn't there in the deterministic case. But the other thing you will notice is that this f is not time dependent. Okay. So here we assume that f is a function of t. Here f is not a function of t. Okay, it's, it's stationary. Okay, the F doesn't change over the entire decision horizon. Um, so if you are looking at a rocket and you're looking at the movement of a rocket in space, the mass of the rocket changes over a period of time. Okay, and if you assume that mass is one of the state of the system, then of course you can mo model it as an MDP. But for some reason, let's say you forgot to include mass as one of the states of the system, then your F is time dependent, okay? Because your mass is time dependent. So- uh, Why would you want to do it that way? Is there a reason or? Uh, well, if you don't want to have a large number of states, then you have to compactify. You just have to consider those states that you think are important. But th that, that doesn't reduce the complexity of the problem because then you just say, well, now instead of having all these states, now I have multiple functions, right? So what, what do we get? Yeah, but your FT remains the same for that particular okay. time step. Okay. Okay, so that doesn't change. Um, okay. All right, so... What I'm going to cover now is there are three different types of, so now that it's a stochastic, so because of this noise variable, okay, there is a lot more complexity in the problem. So I'm going to introduce three different types of policies and three different types of cost functions for Markov decision problems. Okay, so let's look at three different definitions of policies. So, the first class of policies is history dependent. So your ut is a function of gamma t of x0 all the way up to xt, okay? So once you observe the state, you store it in a storage media in your hard disk, and you keep track of the entire sequence of states that you have seen until now, and then you base your decision according to some map of this entire data set that you have. The second one is state dependent time varying policy. 
So you have ut which is a function of gamma t of xt. So if I give you this policy, history dependent policy, you say, oh look, after my time t becomes large, I have to store so much of data, I don't have enough storage space. Why don't I just have a policy that this looks into, a, just takes into account the current state. Okay, so I just reduce the memory requirement by a huge amount by just looking at the current stage, feeding it into the control algorithm and then getting the uh, decision variable. And then the third, uh, but, but then you have to keep, you have to store the policy for every point of time, right? So, so again, the storage space requirement for this gamma t grows. So the third one is state dependent stationary policy, which is known as Markov policy. So your ut is a function of gamma evaluated at xt. So there's no special uh, notion here of a history dependent policy that only goes back, you know, a fixed number of steps. Yes. So this, well, you could also, yeah, so that is uh, basically you are truncating mm -hmm. your entire history and then just using that truncated history to take the action, yeah. So you can define all those other policies also. Uh, so let me call this HD, let me call this STTV, and let me call this Markov. And what we will notice is Markov policy is a subset of, like the set of Markov policies is a subset of STTV, which is a subset of history dependent policies, okay? So every Markov policy is a state dependent time varying policy. Every state dependent time varying policy is a history dependent policy, okay? So there is a strict inclusion as you go from three to one, right? Is it clear? Okay, now we have three criteria, three objective functions so the first objective function is discounted cost discounted cost so my j of gamma so let me define gamma as gamma one or gamma zero, gamma one, all the way up to infinity. So by the way, there is no limit. So T goes all the way from T equals zero, one, two, all the way to infinity, okay? So that our previous methods are not going to be applicable at all, right? Because the previous methods all assume that we could go to the end yes. of the problem. Yes. Okay, so the discounted cost is I will take the expected value of t equals zero to infinity, beta raised to t, c of xt comma ut, given ut is gamma t of whatever. Okay, so depending upon whether you are a history dependent policy, state dependent time varying policy or stationary policy, you can pick appropriate policy and appropriate variables here. Okay, beta is in 0, 0,1. Is that the hyperbolic discounting? It's not hyperbolic discounting. It's exponential discounting because there's beta raised to t, okay, at every point of time. So this leads to a time consistent policy, strongly time consistent policy. Um, which is not very difficult to prove. Okay, so this is discounted cost criterion. Why is discounted cost criterion important? Okay. Uh, so you use discounted cost criterion because you assume that 
the costly decisions you will make in the future are not as important as decisions right now. Okay? So, future is not as important. My current time is much more important than future time. Uh, it's useful in finance because the inflation always reduces the value of $1 today, right? So your beta is always, in, in finance for instance, your beta will be one over one plus inflation, typically, okay? So if inflation is 2%, your beta will be one over 1.02. So in the case of finance, the value of money goes down over long periods of time because of inflation. Uh, in engineering settings, what's going to happen in the future is not as important as what's happening right now. And so I want to discount the future cost a lot more than discounting the current cost. Uh, so to give you an example, let's say your beta was 0 0.1, then your beta raised to 5 is 10 raised to minus 5, right? So essentially what happens Okay, roughly what happens after five time steps is not important at all because the discount factor essentially makes it almost equal to zero. Um, okay, so, so that's, the, that's the meaning of this discount factor. Any questions so far? Okay. The second one is average cost J of gamma equals to limb soup of capital T going to infinity expected value of 1 over capital T summation T equals 0 to T minus 1 C of xt comma ut, ut equals gamma t, and so on. Yes? So all of the cost functions that we're getting from um, j, they, what uh, transition occurs in the meaning since we no longer have, have the terminal cost uh, to you know, account for like the difference from the targeting location we were mm -hmm. having in uh, c when we were dealing with the fixed horizon and it was just the cost of that uh, operation, and then we took care of the cost for how far right. off you were right. at the terminal yes. Yes. operation. So how do we begin to encode wanting to progress towards a direction or anything and when we don't have a fixed horizon? So basically what you would do is, uh, um, let me think. You uh, not just assign a high cost to undesirable no, because then you will have a high cost at the very beginning, right? So what he's saying is, I don't know the terminal time, but I want to include the fact that you might be far off from that particular area of interest. How can you include that in the cost function here? And I'm trying to think, how would you do that? If you didn't know when exactly you're going to end your decision problem. Uh, I'll think about that problem, okay? I don't quite know if there is a good answer to that question. Typically how you would, I mean how I would solve such a problem if I had to do that is for the first, I don't know, first 5,000 time steps, I'm going to use Markov policy, like the MDP kind of policy, mm -hmm. and then after that I'll again switch to the deterministic, this formulation, okay. so. That doesn't give me global optimality guarantee, but it gives me close to being optimal guarantee. Okay, so when is average cost problem important? Uh, so if you see, the cost has a weight of one over T at every point of time, right? Uh, which is in contrast to this beta raised to T where you're discounting the future cost. In this case, everything is important. Okay, the cost today is important, the cost tomorrow is important, the cost day after tomorrow is important, and so on. Yeah. 
So what sort of problem would naturally lend itself to that? Because that, that my fundamental thinking was like a natural res uh, resource utilization problem where you don't have, have like any renewability there if you're talking about uh, how yes. you have to use coal for something. That's right. Well, I mean, that is under the assumption that there is a finite amount of coal and we will not be able to find any new coal deposits in the future. So yes, in that case, well, but there also the problem is that the economy today is more important than economy 50 years later, right? I mean, that's what the government thinks. <laughs> yeah, that's not the case, the, okay? Uh, but discounted cost is the politician's fault. We understand that's right, that. yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, uh, so what, what but when, is, when is average cost important? So let's say you're doing something, you're taking decisions which are of the order of microseconds, Okay, so each t is, so t going from zero to one is 10 raised to minus six second. So you're essentially taking 10 raised to six decisions in one second, right? So you will probably use the average cost model and not the discounted cost model, unless it is required for some mathematical reason, okay? Uh, these, these problems are notoriously hard in comparison to these problems, okay? Um, and the reason for that you know, I can say that, but I don't know, I mean, it, it's not something that all of you will understand. It's because this beta serves as a contraction coefficient for certain contraction maps, okay, that we will cover probably in the next class. Uh, in this case, there is no contraction coefficient, okay? It's, it's not a contraction map in most cases, and therefore, uh, it's much harder to solve problems of this type. So anyways, uh, so that's why Banach contraction mapping theorem appears even in the case of MDPs. Um, I have a question. For the policies that they're conditioned on, are, is it only SDTV and HD that apply there? No, you could also have Markov policy where gamma T is the same okay. all the time. Even though you have a dependency on T for gamma there? Yes, I'm showing the dependency on T because it's much more general. As I said that this is included in this and this is included in this. Okay. So you can just assume the history dependent policy there for the time being, just for simplicity or for your understanding, but you could have other models of policies as well. Yes? Would you ever have a policy model where air, the control you've had at the present moment was a function of both the state previously and the controls previously? Yeah, you can have, you can have those policies also. So this is, this is only dependence on the states, but you could also add U0, U1, U2, U3, all that. But the problem with that is since u0 is a function of x0 and u1 is a function of x0 and x1 and all that, you can just suppress all that dependence and just make it a function of x0 to xt. Okay, so this is an average cost. Everything is important. My cost today is important. My cost tomorrow is important. My cost at time t equals infinity is also important, as important as, as the current cost is. And the third one is total cost problem where J of gamma is limb soup, no, yeah, limb soup, T goes to infinity, expected value of T equals zero to capital T C of X T comma U T given U T equals gamma T. Yes. So uh, compared to the average cost model, while they're both going limb soup, t goes to infinity. Right. Why is total cost going to t and average cost going to t minus one? Oh, because this is t equals zero to t minus one is total t time steps, and so you have t here. If I make it going all the way from zero to t, then I'll just add one here. Okay. Just to make sure that you're weighting everything properly. Yep. Okay. So this is going from t equals zero to t of the total cost. So when is total cost important? Well, when you care about the delay of individual packets going from point A to point B, so the total delay is the sum of the delay at individual, between individual routers. Um, or if you have a vehicle that is navigating on the road and you want to go from point A to point B, then the total cost will be, for instance, the total fuel consumption, okay? So you don't care about the average fuel consumption from going from point A to point B, you want to consider the total fuel consumption from going from point A to point B. So that's where you have total cost problems. Uh, in fact, uh, you might have heard of these chess playing algorithms or whatever, the game of Go playing algorithm, they are all total cost problems, okay? Because you want to win the game eventually, 
right? So your cost is zero, 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 and then suddenly you win. So that's a reward of whatever hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. So that's the total cost problem. Yes. So I, I can understand how Go would work very well with the total cost model. Yeah. Why does chess work well with the total cost? So if you're XT, so so what is XT in chess? So in chess, the XT would be the configuration of all the pawns on the board. Yeah. And when your XT is in some set, then you get a total reward of one. If your XT is in some other set, you lose. Your total reward is minus, I mean, your reward is minus one. Otherwise, the reward is zero because the game has not terminated yet. Okay, so uh, you're thinking of it as uh, just absolute win-loss. Yes, loss, and yes. And then extending that condition to go, whereas as in go, you could have something like you wanted to optimize the amount of territory you control right. instead of just having a straight win-loss yeah. configuration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So is that clear? So we have three different, yeah. So is the expectation with respect to you or respect to Oh, that's a good point. So what is this expectation with respect to? Well, it's so ut is a function of x, right? xt is a function of x0 and all the w's and the u's, okay? But u's are functions of x. So essentially, the only randomness is x0, which is the initial condition, and all the noises going from time zero all the way to time infinity. So this expectation is with respect to the noise and with respect to the initial state. If initial state is random, if initial state is given, then it's all a function only of uh, the W0, W1, all the way to W infinity. Yes? Is the expectation is a conditional expectation? So, uh, it's not, so this is, this is not, so even though I write it as a conditional, it is essentially just saying that this random variable ut is essentially a function of x0 to xt, okay? And that essentially makes this j a function of gamma rather than the function of xt or ut, okay? So for uh, continuing the game modeling here, there are these models all work well uh, when you have some um, default configuration or the board is blank and, and not uh, as right. easily when So x naught is kind of deterministic in the case of chess, for instance, mm -hmm. which is a game I'm more familiar with, right? So x naught is the configuration of the board at the very beginning, okay. which so, is set. So uh, all these models assume you're given x0 and you wouldn't use these models to calculate the optimal initial setup. Oh yeah, you won't. Yeah, you won't use this to compute the op initial setup. Okay, initial setup is always given in these problems. You don't optimize them. Okay, so as you can see, even though we have, I mean, we thought that this problem is complicated, right? Because we had to understand what the value function is and what the backward induction is and all that stuff. Now you see that the real challenge comes when you start analyzing stochastic problems over long periods of time because now you have different notions of policies and you have different notions of objective functions that you could use in infinite horizon setting. So the real challenge, let's say this was 1930s and this problem was posed to you that look, I have I have this model, this is a very general model, it's useful in many, many settings, okay? And I could have these three different class of policies and I could have these three different class of objective functions. Uh, how do we start thinking about these problems, okay? So what's the first thing that would come to your mind? What is it that you would want to first investigate if you were given this setting and this problem? Yeah. I would start with the um, Markov approach, mm -hmm. which, because uh, it's much less information to have to continuously carry around. Uh, have you already studied MDP? Uh, no? no, it's just you okay. said 1930s, so I'm assuming that you have somebody sitting there at a desk, desk and, and we go up and generalize the more data we can tolerate, right. and the right. more modern methods we can use to use Yes, the yes, okay. So his point is, so Matthew's point is that the first thing we would want to do is, let's say we consider this particular problem, discounted cost problem, with Markov policies, okay? Um, so using the simple solution, there's no point in the other ones. <laughs> okay, so his point is that since this is the simplest policy, 
in among all these three policies why not try to minimize this cost uh, assuming that we will use markov policies at every point of time okay and after all it's not clear you stand the definition tell me excuse me that's a pun it has dt hd oh no <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 uh, no. It's not uh, an advertisement for TVs. Uh, it's just happened to be TVs. So I was really hoping TVs. you were going to put TV in there, but you gave it. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you could have a zero being in UHD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So the first problem would be I want to minimize, let's say, J of gamma such that your gamma t is equal to gamma. Okay, so it's a Markov policy. Okay. So we want to solve that problem. Here is the coolest result from MDP theory. Okay, so let me write that as a theorem. Where do I write it? Let me write it here. Theorem. So let gamma bar HD star be the optimal history-dependent policy, okay? So somebody gave me, somebody solved this problem, okay, and gave me an optimal history-dependent policy. Then there exists a Markov policy gamma star such that j of gamma star let me call it m gamma star m is equal to j of gamma star ht okay for all three problems for all three objective functions okay so i'll let you guys write and then we'll ponder about this result Yes. So uh, was the theorem constructed after the model, or were the objective functions constructed in such a way they, that, that they were found to be useful and they fit that, they fit that criteria? Uh, so you're really talk, uh, asking me a question about history, and I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, in fact, whoever would know the answer to that is probably already dead. Uh, so. <laughs> So it's not like I can send an email to someone and say, hey, look, what's the history of this, okay. this theorem? Or maybe I can go back and look at some books written in 1940s to see what the history of that theorem is. Okay. Uh, naturally, we want this, this history-dependent policy to yield finite cost. If it is an infinite cost, then there is nothing much one can do about it. It basically means that no matter what you do, your total cost is going to be infinity. Then I don't care whether it's a good policy or a bad policy because the cost is infinity. So I'm assuming the problem is well posed if these costs, there exists at least one policy so that these costs are finite. Okay, so what this is saying is if I'm given a history dependent policy, the optimal history dependent policy, then I can find a Markov policy that gives me the same cost, which means I don't have to look at any policy that is non-Markov because I can always find a Markov policy that will match the same cost, which will have the same cost as the original history-dependent policy. Now that is only because the underlying process that's generating your states is actually a Markov process. It's a Markov process, yeah. 
because if it wasn't a markov process then right then you have a problem would not be yes yes uh, but if you don't have a markov process then you can probably augment the state space which you have done in one of the assignments and then you try to make it a markov process so that you can you can use that result to come up with a markov policy over the new state new state space okay so this theorem is beautiful because instead of storing all the data and storing all the policies, you don't have to store the data and you just have to store one policy. Okay, just one policy on your computer or on your laptop or whatever. Okay, and that policy will be optimal no matter how big your entire space of policies is. Now I want to draw your attention to this particular inclusion. So the set of Markov policies is small. The set of, so this is M, this is SDTV, and this is your HD policy. And what I'm essentially suggesting is the optimal cost actually lies, so the optimal policy will actually lie somewhere here within this set okay even if you're maximize if, even if you're minimizing over this big set you will have an optimal policy right here in the Markov set which is extremely small in comparison to all the history dependent policies so that's really the true beauty of this whole framework of MDP yes how complicated is the theorem very complicated okay, okay. Uh, yeah, it's pretty complicated term. Now, uh, this, does this mean then that in order to ad address one of these problems, we must start by finding an HD policy? Or no, you just have to, to you just have to go to Markov policy, right? So once you know that the solution is in this set, and that's a theoretical result. So if you know the solution is in this set, you just com consider solving the optimization problem within this set, which is a much smaller set to look for solutions in. All right, any other questions? Yes? Is this set, is the optimal set or the... Term? What do you mean by optimal set? All the optimal points. The solution of... So the solution over, so the solution of that problem over this entire set, there will be a solution right here in the Markov policy. No, there will be an optimal policy there. You see, there will be an optimal policy here, there will be here, some optimal policy will be here, but they all have the same cost, right? So because of that theorem, so why not just focus on this set and find an optimal policy in the smaller set, okay? That does not mean that every problem of this type has an optimal policy, though, is that correct? Yes, so your optimal policy will only will i mean you have to prove somehow that there exists an optimal policy which is another very difficult theoretical result mm -hmm. in generality in, in complete generality of course you can have make assumptions everything is finite and all that stuff in order to uh, <coughs> prove the result uh, but if you want to do it in complete generality then you have to build a lot of tools before you can get there well couldn't we come at it from a different direction and say uh, we find the most optimal Markov policy and, and with whatever assumptions we use to generate that most optimal Markov policy, we're not going to be able to come up with a better policy than that under our initial assumptions. And I mean, that's what this, this well, theorem well, is it, saying. It, it's coming at it from a, a different direction than yes. and, uh, needing to prove that optimality exists. It's just if, if you have a sufficiently good uh, Markov policy yeah, under your assumptions, and that it's the best. Yeah. yeah. So what are the assumptions we are making? Here, I just want to clarify the assumptions so that there is no room for any doubt. So 
So WT is independent and identically distributed. So the distribution of when it's going to rain and how much it's going to rain should not change with time. Okay. F does not change. C does not change. Uh, the max of absolute value of C is finite. There exist gamma such that j gamma is less than infinity. Yeah. So the max statement first for the absolute value of c and u. Uh, what requirements on x and u? Is it there a power that doesn't really make sense? Is it for finite x and u, the absolute value has to be finite, or? Um, Good question. So in more general situations, you could have your x and u in, let's say, r, and your c of x comma u would be x transpose qx plus u transpose ru. But then these costs are going to infinity. Mm -hmm. It'll just so happen that the points at which they are infinite will have zero measure, will, will have very small probability of happening, right? But then these are much more technical issues. I mean, much more. Uh, so these are more of a mathematical problems. But in, we know that in our day-to-day -day life, we are never going to see x going to infinity. So the reservoir, the total height of the reservoir will not go to infinity, because that will be end of universe. Or uh, <laughs> the u will not go to infinity, because that would mean that the entire moisture has basically just gotten dumped into the reservoir and so on. Okay, so. Uh, so yeah, there are mathematical questions that you could ask, and there are beautiful results about it. But in most situations, just having x and u finite and this max being less than infinity, or x and u being in compact set, and the total cost being finite in that compact set is sufficient. OK? Uh, OK, so these are the assumptions that are implicit in this definition of MDP problem. So F doesn't change with time. WT is IID, so they are independent and identically distributed across time. The total cost is finite, so this is one stage cost. So the one stage cost is finite, and there, there exists a policy such that you could achieve a finite cost. It need not be an optimal policy, it's just one policy, a heuristic. Okay, you come up with a heuristic to play chess that gives you a finite cost. Okay, so that's completely fine. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're talking about the trivial existence of that heuristic. Mm -hmm. uh, for the chess playing strategy, it would. Uh, it will always be finite because your cost is terminal and. Because you could just yeah. surrender and that would give yeah. you a negative one result. That's right. Okay. Okay, but. Uh, uh, let's say it's a fuel consumption problem, right? So you could have a policy which goes around a circle for infinite number of times and then gets to the destination, and that's an infinite cost, right? Because your fuel consumed will be infinite. Uh, but you can always find a heuristic, you know, just take this road, take that road, get to your destination, and that's a finite cost. Now the question is, can you optimize it even further to get a better fuel consumption? Okay, so typically when you have uh, uh, when you have cycles in your policies, you could get into situations where some policies will have infinite cost. Okay, so you just want to avoid um, having those policies in your policy set. Uh, you know, these are all details. I don't want to get into very detailed description of when these situations may be violated. 
uh, because those are all technical conditions. And then you can make several assumptions where those conditions, where uh, those assumptions leads to a situation where there is no infinite cost. Okay, so I don't want to get into all those details. Okay. So in the next class, what I'm going to do is introduce value iteration algorithm, value iteration algorithm, which yields gamma star, which is Markov, and which minimizes the total discounted cost. Okay, so this value iteration algorithm for discounted cost problem, which will yield the optimal Markov policy for an MDP. And once I do that, then I'll just conclude this entire uh, course by stating a few things that we have studied in the class. And of course, some, uh, uh, some publicity for the course that I'm offering next year which is ECE 8851, which is a reinforcement learning class, where we will go into much more details about MDPs and some of the latest research that are happening in the, in the field of what is known as reinforcement learning. Okay, so that's it. I'll meet you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>